On the bunker today, we're talking to Barbara and Dimana. They are from the Prague chapter of the Future Females. Prague chapter sounds a little bit like Hells Angels because they have chapters, but uh, this is a very different organization. Um, they told me about how young women can um, have a career, how they can kind of bypass the, the glass ceiling by starting their own business. And basically what it is that is standing in the way of of young women in this country uh, when it comes to, let's say, career opportunities and so on. Um, they also explained to me what Future Fem Females is. It's a global organization that, that helps women. Um, interesting stuff, very, very interesting. And uh, it was a very big pleasure for me to have them. Um, hope you enjoy. And just very quickly about the sponsors, uh, Alfred.c said, that's where you find your job. Uh, no one should accept being in a miserable job, so go and look for a new one. And if you tell Alfred what you want, he will find it for you. Don't worry. Alfred.c said. And the old bar, uh, that's in Prague, uh, Karlin, Grisikova, Center of the Universe, Oatmeals, Skiers, Healthy Goodies, Juices, Takeaway, Delivery, it's a perfect place. Try it out. Uh, welcome, future females, uh, Barbara and Timana. How are you? Hi, thank you for uh, welcoming us in this amazing podcast. Yeah, it's how do pleasure. you like my bunker? <laughs> I love it. It's yeah. a real bunker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's on the top floor, though. Yeah, you have a nice view, actually. Yeah. Because now the sun is setting, so it's quite nice to see the lights going up. Yeah. 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 As well, the neighborhood, it's a really good one. Yeah. I like it. I, I, when you're a successful podcaster like me, then you can afford this kind of stuff, you <laughs> know, like the top floor somewhere. And I know. Yeah, it's this is what five listeners give you. <laughs> <laughs> well, imagine what 20 will. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I can't even think in numbers like that. <laughs> anyway, so um, the reason why you're here... Uh, both of you, is that um, I came across an article uh, the other day on a web page here that uh, was about gender equality, pay gap, and, and the different uh, topics of, of um, around yeah women and females. And then I realized that <coughs> you're part of an organization that is called Future Females. Um, can you tell me a little bit what what is Future Females? Future Females was launched in the Czech Republic in November 2020 and were part of the global organization Future Females, mm. which is um, a movement and an organization at the same time to support um, aspiring entrepreneurs. We are focused on um, empower, um, empowering um, female business owners. We want to encourage women to um, found their own startups, to start their own businesses on the local market here. And um, we actually, when we started with Barra, we thought um, the local market, the business industry can use something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how the idea was born, basically. So the purpose being that is to support women in, in more in entrepreneurship um, than, than necessarily in the regular labor market or... Yes, definitely. Because uh, usually when you are working in a bigger corporate and company, you get certain support. But if you are a standalone unit in the mm -hmm. whole world and you would love to bring your own idea alive, uh, you need support. And it's amazing if you can have a role model, someone who will mentor you and support you and as well share with you her or his own fails to mm. uh, as well get some learnings. So, mm. yeah, entrepreneurs are uh, our focus. And what's the... Why is this needed? I mean, what, what um, isn't it possible to be an entrepreneur woman? Do we need an organization like this? I mean, what, what, what's the, where does the need come from? Oh, it's definitely possible to be an entrepreneur woman without um, something like that, but it would be a lot more difficult um, if um, you don't have access to, uh, to, to, the, to the platform that um, we provide to people. Because... Nowadays, for women to start their businesses, there are a few major factors that affect uh, why they're not doing it. So mm. um, the first thing is the lack of resources, um, lack of funding, um, the lack of access to um, different tools that will help them to do that business. 
and um, actually lack of confidence as mm. well. So by forming future females, we wanted to provide that support system for these entrepreneurs on the market here. And um, we, we run our monthly events that are uh, based on various industries where we have different speakers, um, they're experts in their own pers- respective industries um, that uh, provide their expertise and experience uh, to our listeners. Mm. And uh, additionally, we have workshops which are a lot more targeted, a lot more specific on a niche subject. And um, we think that that could be very useful mm. um, here. Um, so yeah, this is like in a nutshell, yeah. basically why yeah. we think it was it was needed. I mean, you definitely have um, other organizations that do it here on the market, but we're more focused on uh, providing experts mm-hmm. here uh, that bring direct knowledge to a wider range of an audience. Yeah, the it's a global organization and. Uh, where, where where did it start originally? Where where was the first? Uh uh, the founders they started the first official chapter in South Africa. Uh-huh. Because they uh, joined, I think it was a startup accelerator, something like that, and they just found out, oh wow, we are almost only two women here. There is no one else uh, representing the <laughs> second gender, only male around us. So they started to think that uh, there is something wrong, and then. Uh, they connected with um, other f- female around the world and they realized, hmm, so it's not only here in South Africa, it seems it's a problem or opportunity, let's put it this way, as well in other countries. So this is how other chapters started to be founded. And yeah, now I think there is there are 80,000 uh, women who are actually members or part of uh, uh-huh. Future Females communities, which is an amazing number. And how many chapters around the world did you say? 38. Yeah, I countries? think so. 39, yeah. 38, yeah. Yeah. And it's growing. Basically, like almost every two, three months, you There's have see more women one. joining from different um, parts of the world. So our newest additions are in um, Southeast Asia, uh-huh. in Malaysia, and in Indonesia. So it's uh, basically, um, we have representation in every continent, I think, maybe except for Australia. Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, I like that you call it chapters. It's kind of like Hell's Angels, the motorbike yeah. gang. You know, they, that's the proud chapter. You know, it yeah. gives it a little badass. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. not really branches; it's chapters. Yeah, so chapter. we're wrong. <laughs> yeah. But um, future females is that? Is it? Is it feminism, or or or, or is it just a support organization for entrepreneurs that are of the right gender? <laughs> um, you know. To answer this question, I think we need to know a bit more what feminism exactly is and mm. how it's perceived nowadays. Um, so, A, yes, it is a support platform, um, support system for entrepreneurs. Um, but if you think a little bit deeper than that and you dive beneath the surface, um, it is feminism, but um, it's not the radical feminism that um, has gained a lot of popularity nowadays. Um, it's more uh, the liberal feminism, let's mm. put it like that, where um, we want to target um, discrepancies and disparities more on an institutional level rather mm. than completely reshape the whole uh, relationship between men and women where uh, women have to be necessarily on top and men <laughs> should be subordinate. That is definitely not um, the idea here. Mm. But um, in a way, b- it could be perceived as feminism it could be perceived as cultural feminism as well where um, we take advantage of the um, uh, specific characteristics that females have when uh, they in their relationships in their business relationships and how they operate um, how they work in different environments and um, yeah just just taking advantage of that Mm. in in the specific business sphere for example but what about all the other genders? Uh, now we have a new gender every day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, what about the other genders? The other genders... Uh, I mean, are they welcome <laughs> or is this... Oh, no, it's not discriminatory. No? Uh, no, 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 not by any means. It's not discriminatory. It could be... Uh, I mean, this is a platform that educates. Mm-hmm. You know, it provides knowledge. It provides opportunity for you to take advantage of what we offer. So um, our events are open to anyone. Just because we're called Future Females, it doesn't mean that men cannot um, come. Uh, We actually target always having male speakers Mm -hmm. so far. So that, um, well, except for our first event, which we had only um, 
uh, our uh, first uh, female speaker uh, for the launch event. But since then, we've had uh, male speakers because we do want to bring men into the discussion for them to be part of this mm. uh, this change, mm. I guess. So men are more than welcome to come. That's uh, good to like know. Like I said, they can use our platform. Yeah. You know? Just didn't want to feel left out. But, um, <laughs> Not at all. Maybe I would add one, one thing because what I... What I do see is that it's good as well to look at it from the other side, like vice versa, that if it will not be called future females or let's say the women community, women will not participate because they would not feel that they are welcome, they do mm. not feel confident. However, men, they do not have this feeling that they need to double check, triple check if they are allowed to, to, to join. So I think that that's why all of those communities are pushing this women, female naming, because then as a woman, you feel, ah, okay, it's for women. So there will be women around me. So I will feel welcome if it is called like generic or let's say IT business startup community always say mm, okay but I am not experienced so maybe as a woman I will be there the only one so that's why I, I'm not joining so mm. I think that maybe it creates this kind of feeling oh my god only uh, those uh, activities are happening for women but I think it's mainly because we need to make them confident that it's, that for, they are, them. Yeah, that yeah. it's for them and they are welcome yeah, yeah. Ironically, we're getting actually a lot of attention from male business owners, which is great. Yeah, you know. No, and I think I think I mean obviously it must be, uh, um, or it should be, uh, socially viable and, and socially viable and, and economically viable to activate that other half of the yeah. society. You know, it, it it doesn't. There is no. <laughs> there is nothing historically that indicates that that men are better at doing everything business-wise and politically than, than women. I mean, they're actually, it's the other way around. Most of the bad stuff that has happened in the world is, is when, when a lot of men got into a room <laughs> with <laughs> egos. But um, anyway, so <coughs> let's get back a little bit. Barbara, you you are from Czech Republic, right? Yes. And uh, born and raised here, or, or what's your story? Yeah, I was born here, actually, in Prague, almost close to Karlin, where we are now sitting, in Prague 1. And, yeah, so uh, I was born to uh, uh, my, my father and mother, who are doctor and tennis player, uh, tennis coach and tennis player, which gave me a lot of um, things which I am now ap appreciating and as well building up my own life and career, so... Maybe talking more about um, my mom, because maybe it sounds like a cliche, but actually she's a role model for me because um, she's a doc doctor. And even at that time, it was not so common that mm. as a woman, you are leaving your kids at home and, and going to work. She did it and she just didn't care if uh, someone is uh, blaming her or not. She just did it because she wanted to build up her career because as a doctor, of course, you dedicate your life to help others and she wanted to continue. And uh, on the other side, I have never felt that uh, I didn't have my mom, I didn't have my childhood, so everything was great. And mm. um, from that, I, I saw that, okay, it's uh, important to work, to, to work on yourself and to develop your skills and... Yeah, this is how I how I do it in my personal and, and working life. And yes, yeah, thanks to my mom. And coming back to my father, he, he as an athlete, of course, he as well gave me uh, many great um, things such as always like compete and not to give up. So yeah, I'm actually never giving up. So <laughs> this no. is my attitude. And, uh, and I, I guess like, when you have this, like you say, you have a role model in, in your mom in, in, in the sense that you look at her. She, she must have been different from a lot of the other moms around, right? I mean, like because she had a career and the other moms, your friend's moms, for example, they, might, they, they were maybe at home. Or, or, or did, did this, I don't know, I mean, did this push you in a certain direction somehow? Or, or, or and did you feel that at some point that... Um, anyone or the system was telling you, hey, you're just a girl, don't push it. 
Of course, the situation was a bit different because my grandma, she went um, to pension when she was 48, uh-huh. which nowadays, wow, 48, you are starting your career, actually, <laughs> almost. So, yeah, she, ha- she had the support of my um, grandparents, so they, were ta- they took care of me, mm. but uh, I didn't realize it till the moment I was adult and of course I'm as well thinking about having a family and I see that it it was not common that mm-hmm. uh, as a mom as a woman you were working like 30 40 years ago and I see like um, around my friends that their mom they were with them even six eight years at home if they have any siblings so I think that of course, she had uh, help from my grandparents. Without them, it will be hardly possible because that time there were no uh, child care or yeah. a nurse or a nanny, something like that. So I think that, yeah, she was lucky that she had this support. But you kind of, you didn't realize it back then that it yeah, it's more like something that you said, like when you get older yourself, then you kind of start realizing, wow, this was really something. Um, yeah. Dimana... What about you? You're you're not from the Czech Republic. No, born and bred in Bulgaria. Yeah, um, I was born there in uh, a little city called Varna. It's mm-hmm. on the coast of Black Sea, mm-hmm. and I grew up in a quite a big family. And in general, for anyone who knows the southern cultures, we are very much growing up together. A mm-hmm. lot of cousins, a lot of aunts and uncles, um, grandparents were heavily involved. So probably until I was. I was raised by my grandparents Mm -hmm. because my parents were, um, they hit me very young. Like my mom was 20, I think, 21. My father was 23. So um, basically they they, they had me and my sister and um, they... Um, well, young and wild, and I they handed lived you o- their life. Handed you over to their parents. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but you know, um, in Bulgaria, it is very typical for the grandparents to be uh, extremely involved. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, my greatest influences in my early lives were in my early lives, my early life <laughs> was um, were my grandparents, and um, then when the resp- responsibilities shifted back to my uh, parents, um, they actually both of them turned into, like Bara said, into role models, but I realized that they were role models a lot later mm-hmm. in life, mm-hmm. um, to be honest. So I grew up in a very, very happy environment, very supportive environment, very uh, wonderful uh, memories, which is why it was very hard for me to leave uh, Bulgaria behind mm. and um, look for new opportunities here. Mm. Because uh, at the time when I was graduating from high school, um, Bulgaria was not the best opportunity to study there mm. because of um, mafia situations and uh, the, the the complete lack of opportunity, to be honest. Mm. And the whole state of the educational system, it just doesn't provide a great escape mm-hmm. from what you are in a way meant to be. You know, um, Bulgaria is a very patriarch- patriarchal patriarchal society so um not many women work mm. um they cur- having a career as a woman is not a thing in general most of the women they're at home they raise their children uh, while the men are working mm-hmm. so mm, that translates even today to um people's relationships you know when yeah. you go somewhere for example um, you have a lot of women are separated on the side, men are on the other side, and each of them has their own topics of conversation. You know, mm. men are more like into male topics of business and mm. sports and cars and um, whatever they talk about, and um, girls have different topics. I mean, I, the feminine yeah, <laughs> yeah. topics in a way. Mm, and I you didn't want to be part of this. I n- I never felt very comfortable in that because I always had a lot of male friends. Mm-hmm. I got along more with the guys. Um, maybe because I'm a lot more outspoken and direct and um, I never liked these games between girls of talking behind your back or like, you know, separating into groups or something like that. Mm. And um, this this way of thinking never related to me in any way. I always felt in a way that I was different than anyone else. Even though I had a lot of friends and um, in high school I was part of the popular group of kids. 
uh, because I like being with people. I'm an extrovert. I, I like talking to people mm. sometimes too much. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Some, seriously, yeah. My, my mother always says that I talk too much. Our Skype conversations never end. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, the, the typical mindset never mm. really, uh, I c- never connected with it. But it's probably because my family is not with a typical mindset. Mm. Uh, a lot. Uh, my, my, my parents always taught me uh, to look beyond what is in front of me. Yeah. Dig deeper beneath the surface. Think a bit more. So. And if you, I mean, it, but, but is there something there that you can kind of, um, how do you say, translate into saying, okay, so it's obvious because of how it was that I'm now part of something like Future Females. Um, future females came to me a lot later than yeah, yeah, you obvi- would expect. Obvi- uh-huh. You know, because um, I, I, like I said, I grew up with a with a society where I was not comfortable with the mindset, but I did have the mindset because I was part of it, part of it. You know, mm. so I understood it, and I, it was I was comfortable with it. Um, I mean, how to say it? Comfortable and not comfortable at the same time. It was what I knew, but I knew there's something more. Mm-hmm. That needs to be done. And um, when I came here, I uh, finished my university and I had to enter um, the job market right into the middle of the financial crisis in 2010, when jobs were almost non-existent for foreign for, for foreigners, for mm-hmm. English speakers. And um, I had to um, go into a job just to pay my bills, basically. Because my father gave me an ultimatum you either come home or you find a job. I wanted to stay here, mm. so I find a job. And that job was actually the beginning of my deep dissatisfaction with what I would do mm. for a living and that the desire to do something more with an impact was born. Mm-hmm. So for 10 years, I paid my dues and I paid and I paid and I paid and um, I never liked it until finally last year I got out and I found future females, uh-huh. basically. So, um, you know, uh, like I said, future females was not born out of my background. Mm. It was more uh, a transition through the years of not liking what I do, mm. but wanting to do something more mm. for a change. That's interesting. Yeah. Barbara, do you... Um, is there has it been has there ever been anything? Uh, I know you have a career. You're a, have a, have had a really interesting career so far and very successful. Uh, but has there been a, a point in your career where you felt at a disadvantage for being a woman that that they use it against you in some way? Mm. I would say that the topic of diversity and inclusion like boomed l- last year with uh, certain happenings around the world mm. and it opened eyes to many people and I started to think, hmm, that time, two years ago, yeah, it's true. I, I was impacted in a way by the fact that I am a young woman. Mm-hmm. So I started to remember like, okay, that was the situation, this was the situation. So I'm really happy that nowadays people are talking about it. But in terms of some kind of, um, let's say, sexual harassment or this kind of things, I I, I never experience it uh, when it comes to work or even outside of work. But uh, I would say that as I was working in Netherlands and uh, currently in Germany, I am... I, I do feel that the combination of being a woman from Czech Republic, from South, is the combination which is still perceived, not badly, but that people think about it. Mm. If uh, you are good enough, if uh, you you know everything, what uh, women from Germany, if you are qualified enough. So, mm. yeah, I'm facing more this combination of cultural background and uh, gender rather than only uh, being a woman. Mm. No, I definitely, I know this being an Icelandic, um, I can hear my fellow Icelanders, uh, th- th- they would <laughs> never believe that a person from here or from Poland or whatever could do as good as as a person from Iceland. It's it's a, it's some sort of a built-in discrimination, yeah. racism. It's it's a weird thing. I, I, I don't don't get it. And, and, and best 
best part is when people say that oh you cannot raise kids anywhere else than in Iceland but <laughs> but and then I say but all the people that are adults now in those countries they were kids once and they survived you know but that that's a different story so that was a little bit about the kind of I just wanted to ha- hear your back a little bit of kind of how uh, if there was something specific that pushed you into this direction um, but um, I wanted to kind of dive a little bit more maybe into why and and what what's, what needs to be worked on and maybe what is good what what's actually working when it comes to let's say female participation and so on and um, so what are the kind of the main local issues if we talk about the Czech Republic when it comes to female participation and and you know pay, I guess pay gap and these kind of things what, what are the you know the hot topics let's say I would say that when it comes to international like private sphere companies they are getting closer to the point that diversity and inclusion is so important. Uh, there should not be any uh, gap when it comes to salaries, etc. So I think that they are already one step ahead towards state institutions in Czech Republic because they are mainly led by older men over 50s who are living the model that their wives were based in at home, raising the kids, not working and just supporting their careers. So I think that it's about the leadership mindset of state institutions is one thing. And of course, thinking about the, let's say, some uh, quotes or, or something which will really push the companies to, to think about it because you can definitely create some rules internally when it comes to your company, but it's not fair when you leave your current employer and go to the next one, that you will not get the same what you will have in a different company just because they are not respecting this gender gap, etc. So I think that this is one problem. And then the second one I do see it's support for women as well from the state institutions such as um, schools, uh, mainly kindergartens, that... Okay, it's cool to maybe after half year to go back to job, but uh, if you are not having high salary enough to pay a private kindergarten, you mm. cannot go back mm. to, to your job. And I think it's going into the circles that uh, even if you would love to, you need to stay at home three years because you don't have any, any place where to put your kids. So mm. I think this as well needs to be, let's say, more open-minded and give as well part-time opportunities for women, ho- more home offices and not to always be focused 9 to 5 or 8 till 4 and you need to come to the office every day. Mm-hmm. And But these, <coughs> these uh, as you mentioned, like with the state, state in institutions, then those are typically governed by men, usually older men. Um, and then... The regulation and the and and the the um, let's say the the decision making on the on the kindergartens that's also probably decisions made mainly by men, so it's uh, maybe a convenient power that they hold in the country to to keep women down or what yeah. do you think? Yeah, no, definitely it's, it's going to the circus. It reminds me one thing I heard yesterday in the news that um, I think it was uh, uh, like Japanese. Uh, politic who is uh, leading the Olympics mm. and he said publicly that um, he doesn't want have women I- in the committee because they are talking too much you know and, and of course he had to apologize as well but you know it made me think come on like mm. what do you think about yourself so I think that this is the way that men they have their own style and I experienced many times and even sometimes by purpose that I share my thoughts with my colleague and and said, hey, just say it instead of me. And Mm. it was, wow, amazing. And then next time I tried to say it like myself to someone else and it was, you know, put under the table. Mm. So it really showed me, come on, it really depends if it's like women, men, and as well when it comes to levels in a company, if it's a manager, director, or who is telling that. So I think that this is as well 
coming together with this hierarchical thinking. So people mm. here in Czech Republic, they are not used to argue or challenge the bosses. No. So what no. boss says, it's true. And it's, even word, it's the word of God. Yeah. <laughs> the same with teachers, which I know you need to respect teacher, but it, the respect, it's not about following 100% no, what no. people are telling you. So always ask. Yeah. Ask why. Or being afraid. Yeah. You know. Oh, I, 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 I've seen that. I had, I've had experiences here that, um, yeah, I, I felt like when I started running a business here that that people had some godly ideas about my cap, cap capabilities yeah. and skills, which I definitely didn't have those skills. Um, yeah. But uh, a little bit. So, so we're saying the the main local issues is like female participation. It's the gender, the pay gap between the genders, and obviously you know, than in public office more than in private business. But <clears throat> there was a, the article that I saw and, and, and that you were writing, yeah. Dimana, was uh, was about, there's a recent study on the gender equality index. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit or the listeners a little bit about that? Because yeah. that was quite interesting. Um, unfortunately, and quite surprisingly, actually, Czech Republic ranked quite bad mm. um, on that um, index on gender Equality. Um, How bad? I mean, who, who, who was twenty fifth place or something? Wasn't it? No, twenty seventh. I think. I think it was uh, on twenty. I think it was twenty seventh place yeah. um, in, in the, the European, European Union. Union yeah. yeah. Um, so this is quite surprising because you know in in the society where we live, in European Union specifically, you uh, expect um, the developed Western countries like Germany, like. Um, France, like Spain, like Czech Republic as well, uh, which are actually democracies as well, uh, to have gender equality, not to have such a huge gender pay gap mm. as well. Mm. And um, shockingly, those are exactly the countries that have the biggest gender pay gap, mm. for example. Um, I was absolutely surprised to find out that in 2020 still, Germany is on second place and Czech Republic is right behind it on a third place. Mm. Both of them uh, with 20% gender pay gap, which is mm -hmm. ridiculously big, mm -hmm. you know. And then you would expect the um, famous patriarchal um, sort of like backwarded countries, like we all sometimes think about them from the South, like um, Bulgaria, Romania, mm -hmm. uh, Greece, to have a lot more gender pay gap because women stay at home and men work. And actually they have a lot better statistics mm -hmm. than us here in the West. So that indicates that there's definitely something to be done. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, not enough has been done. Because for the last 10 years, um, the difference made was um, to a decimal point, 0 0.7, I think. Yeah. It has moved with like 0.7%, yeah. I think, or something like that. It's a like very that. marginal improvement. It's so tiny and it's so um, embarrassing, even, mm. in a way, to see that uh, with all the efforts, with all the communities that have been here, with everyone that is speaking up, um, on a you know institutional level, nothing has changed, mm. and um, you have to ask yourself why, you know, and you know when when we talk about gender pay gap, we have to also understand what exactly does it mean the gender pay gap because it's really nice to generalize and be like oh we want to change it and mm. we want it to be down to zero percent, but are we talking about the gender pay gap? Um, from an age perspective or from a position perspective as well. And, um, uh, you know, it statistically it increases the, the higher the position is. Mm -hmm. So women in the managerial levels have the biggest pay gap and uh, women on uh, lower positions like um, health and education, for example, have the lowest pay gap because mm -hmm. they're predominantly filled with women. For example, but <coughs> but I'm curious. Like uh, maybe Barbara, you wh why do you think this is like? Because as you said earlier, people here in in, in the Czech Republic and and maybe it's kind of the inheritance of the communist era and so on that you don't challenge the authority and the boss knows best and blah blah blah. But if I try to, if I, you know, I I don't want to be from a country which is performing shitty on some list like this you know like i remember for example iceland got on uh, some blacklist from the uh, uh, international bank because we didn't have uh, some money laundry stuff in place and and yeah. it was like a big thing you know it was like a 
you know, the finance minister had to answer for it in the media. People, like regular people, like, you know, my parents who were 70 years old, they were like, ah, we, we don't want to be on this list, you know? And it's like, it, hurt, it hurts the pride of the nation. And, and I'm so curious about this, that, with, for example, with something like this, what happens when it comes out, when people realize, okay, we are performing very bad here, is it just kind of silenced, or, or does it have an effect? I would say that there is a big difference living in Prague, mm. living in another bigger city, and, and living some on the somewhere in the yeah. countryside. So, of course, I'm living a Prague bubble partially. I'm I'm living I- in Berlin, and I, I was f- I'm already five years abroad, so I am impacted by that fact. So I, I think that there are two things what you can do. One is as an individual and one as a community. And actually I am working on both of them. So one is Future Female, definitely. That's why I partner up with Timana and we would love to work on it. I know that we are two and we will not change the world, but at least I will have this feeling, yes, Barbara, you can say it to your grandchild that, okay, this is why your salary is same as uh, as yeah. your friend because yeah. me as your grandma work on it hard with uh, my friend Imana. So of course it's a long journey, but I do feel that there are more of us and we are working on it hard. And I think that it's already heard as well in um, in a public and as well when it comes to politics that they are discussing it. Mm-hmm. But it will it will take time yeah. when it comes to my personal uh, let's say impact is that uh, I would love to be the role model I would love to uh, be that mom who is a great mom great wife and as well a great manager and building up my own career of course now I am uh, dreaming about it and I do not have a kids yet but I think it is possible mm. and you need to show to people that it is possible even if you are let's say normal person with average salary that you do not need to earn thousands and millions of uh, crowns to be able to pay uh, kindergarten, nanny, etc. That, that you can manage if mm. you would love to. And of course, it's great if you have support of your husband and family. So yeah, I'm, I'm ready, empowered to do this. And mm. I hope that it will work out. But I think we need to, we need to show to those women that it's okay. It's okay, they do not need to feel guilty, blaming themselves, that they are bad moms and people are judging them. They need to feel actually as the new role models, as the new uh, community who is supporting this uh, women movement. Yeah, but that that's one like um, like kind of, but I, I'm, I, I don't know, I don't know if, how to describe this, but if, I'm more wondering if there is like a, the soul of the nation, you know, like you know, like just the. Are, are do people care about this in general? I would say that it's by generations. Uh-huh. I do care. Okay, so but maybe. But older. my mom, she, in a way, care and doesn't care mm-hmm. because she is an entrepreneur, and we talk about it many times. And she was saying, yeah, but for me, it's more challenging to hire a thirty years old woman who mm-hmm. is freshly married. Because I know that she will, she can be eight years on maternity leave, and what yeah. I would do. Yeah. So I am. And this is coming from an yeah. entrepreneur, yeah. female entrepreneur. Yeah, who has two kids. So yeah. you know. So I think that it's always. Yeah, it depends. Uh, yeah, on the environment as well. You know, I think it. I agree, I completely agree with you. Um, oh, when a, thank you. <laughs> historical moment. <laughs> um, no, you know, uh, generally when I tell people about future females, uh, they don't care. Mm. I'll tell you something. And I'm actually quite disappointed and surprised because when I say, oh, you know, I'm starting this with like Bara and we're doing, you know, future females, it's a great platform, like we're empowering female entrepreneurs. And the reaction I see is like, mm. really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wh- what is this? Why, why would you do that? You know, why would you waste your time? And I'm like, it's not wasting time. It's doing something, you know? But... I think it very much depends, like you said earlier, on the mindset. It could be generational. Yes, the older generation might not really care. When mm. I told my parents that I'm going to do that, the reaction was um, unfortunately close to zero. 
you know, it was like, oh, okay, fine. And um, they were, of course, supportive. They were like, of course, do something, you know, like it, if you like it, do it 100%. But the, um, the idea behind it, like what you said earlier, is it feminism? Yeah, in a way it is feminism. Is it to do something more with social impact? Yes, it is. Mm. Um, I don't think that people care enough, you know. Mm. Um, no, but I think it's it's actually not only limited to this. I think it's in many, many, many things many that circles. I sense here that, yeah. that, that, that are about like topics where I would think that people really would want to have an opinion. Maybe they just gave up somehow. Yeah. Um, and okay, so we, we're talking about this particular thing, like the, the, the pay gap. And the, what what is it that, that, you know, future females has as a organization or chapter and, and a platform? that, let's say, addresses this? You know, what what is it? Do you have an agenda or, or like, a, I don't know, like a policy or, or goals? Or, or, or how how are you helping changing this in that sense? I mean, I know you have those tools that you mentioned in the beginning, but is there some sort of a policy or... or I would say that through our events and as well together with um, our amazing speakers... We are encouraging women to speak up and to not to accept if they do not like it and they feel that it, it's not fair. Mm. And of course, um, as we started in November, we definitely have on our list this topic and we would love to invite um, an expert in that. I know that there are a couple of companies who are uh, who started to have, let's say, I, I don't know how it is called, but open salaries minded means that all salaries are transparent. Mm. And they said, yeah, actually, almost half of the people, they left. Because they cannot stand that the guy or women next to me, that she is getting, you know, less, more, and it created, like, a, at the beginning, like, really intense situation. But then at the, sa- at the end, he said, yeah, but now it's amazing. Because no one is, uh, you know, jealous to another one because they know. Mm. And they, un- they of course, respected because they realize yeah he, he's getting this salary because he is great and yeah he he deserves it so i think it's important to um, to have an expert to bring in more as well some statistics and as well what uh, has been done i know that there is equal pay day which is uh, one day when they are celebrating this and it's an event and they are um, giving some bags and some materials to to think about it but come on it's only one day within the whole year Mm -hmm. so i think that we need to do more and i think that it started again with the leadership to Mm -hmm. to have maybe some workshops speak up sessions with those leaders to let them understand and look at it from the other side because maybe even they don't know Mm -hmm. you know one of the reasons why gender pay gap exists actually it's mm. because women can't negotiate their salaries. That's yeah, actually was, one was, of the yeah, reasons. Yeah. And I actually had this conversation with um, my husband yesterday when I was thinking you know, about our podcast and about the gender pay gap. And I'm like, you as a corporate worker, can you tell me why is this? What is your opinion about that? Mm. And he was like, I'll tell you why. Because in corporate environment for the higher levels and for any level, even for entry level, um, women's um, characteristics are that they're not assertive enough and they're not able to negotiate as well with, as men. Mm. And I actually never thought about that because in, in a way it is true. So I researched it and it turns out it's one of the four main mm. uh, reasons why there is the gender pay gap. Yeah. So if you know how to negotiate better, mm. then you can maybe use the same tactics as as uh, your counterpart to receive a good salary if you're more assertive in what you want if you're more sure in your um, qualities in your capabilities in your workplace uh, then mm. uh, maybe you can get better results you know so I'm th- like in relations to future females what we can do mm. yes we can help you maybe build that confidence yeah. where you're gonna stand eye to eye with someone and be like, I want this number. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I want it and because I deserve it. Mm. Not like, oh, well, maybe, maybe no. You know, yeah, you're right. I don't deserve it. Mm. You know, when, you know, compared to the guy who comes in and he's like, I'm the best. 
So, so, so we're saying, that. okay, but Barbara, you mentioned that you know to keep it in the discussion, to bring out the 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 examples, the good examples, to keep them, to get them more attention, so that people realize, okay, there is another way. You mentioned Dimana, this that you b women can come to to future females, or actually anyone can come to future females, and 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 get you know maybe some help with how to get my confidence so that I can ask for what I'm worth. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I, I actually, yeah, I've, I've seen this, what your husband mentioned, I've seen this multiple times, and, and, um, and it's a very interesting way that, you know, we men, we tend to believe that we are God's gift to earth, and yeah. we walk into a room and we deserve whatever is in there, <laughs> and whereas a woman thinks that, okay, I need to really work for this here, and maybe I need to share this with someone and, and there are it's just a different yeah. thinking process um, which is really, really interesting and definitely must be showing up in those numbers. But yeah. um, um, I'm curious also about the, the, the then because you said earlier, Barbara, that it's it's very much about the, um, let's say the public system is, is somehow behind here. Where are politics on this, on kind of gender equality and and feminism? I mean, in this country, is it is it a big topic in politics? Is there is there any particular party that is taking this as an agenda? Or I think that during the last year, uh, almost all the main news, uh, I would say ninety percent of this, it was of course from the Poslanecka uh, Snimovna. I do not know the word in in English, mm. but. Uh, from the institution and uh, yeah you could see how many women were sitting there so it, it, it's starting there i um, listened one podcast from um, she, her name is marketa pekanova adamova and she's a politician and she's i think around 35 years old and she as well uh, recently married and she was sharing this bad feeling she had that all the Colleagues, they were looking at her, ob observing her, if she's serious, if she really thinks that she can make it, yeah, she will go soon to maternity leave, yeah, this is the mm. usual process, and she's there already for some years, and uh, she's successful, so I think that, um, yeah, if <laughs> you will count the average age of um, our politicians, yeah, it will as well answer to your question. Yeah, I've seen it in the TV, it's like a museum. Yeah, it's like a museum, so oh. I think that, yeah, we need as well more young guns going to politics and to to talk about it. But uh, I think that what really works is to, let's say, lead by bad examples mm. or do a bad PR. So I think that one thing is, okay, I can cry every night uh, on my sh uh, husband's shoulder saying, yeah, I, I am not well paid. But, okay, what... What is the sense of this? Because if you will not share it with your boss, if you will not speak up, if you will not go public with that, it will never change. And I mm. think that this is the thing that women are more emotional and we are always thinking about the bad scenarios. So rather than to share it, go public, to be faced uh, with your boss and even the risk that he will say, okay, so then leave, I will not give you higher salary that we are so afraid to face this, that mm. we are then continuing crying to uh, our husband's shoulders and, and living in this unfair situation. Mm. So I think that maybe having some, let's say, bad uh, examples and to bit open up how it really works because people know about it, but mm. uh, you do not really have concrete examples because, of course, companies are hiding it and they do not want to present publicly. Yeah, it's true, we are working on it. No. Mm. So it's, it's, it seems to me that it's, it's, at least now, it's very much about those kind of pioneers, that the, the role models that, that kind of walk the path. And it hasn't really become like a big, broad political agenda as such, you know. I would say that, for example, the Me Too movement. Yeah. Yeah as soon as it started it spread around the world and you felt empowered that it's not only you there are more of you and you are more protected because now the whole world is talking about it mm. so then you decided okay now is the moment to speak up if i would love to change it so mm -hmm. i think that when it comes to gender uh gender pay gap it something like that needs to happen mm. i don't want to say that it needs to be caused by something 
negative that someone needs to suffer, etc. But uh, I think that you need yeah, the radical change. Yeah, you need to have this empowerment not mm. locally in Prague, in Czech Republic, but across the globe. That yeah, you as a women, as a as a community across the world, that you are uh, all together and you are allowed to speak up. Mm. But it's it's um, yeah it's um, it's a really interesting thing because we had it in Iceland. We had uh, I think I told you we had a coffee. Mm-hmm. We actually had a coffee at one of our sponsors' place, the Oat Bar. Mm-hmm. It's, it's awesome. It's great, yeah. And uh, um, we had this political party in Iceland that started in in the late eighties, like seventy eight or something, yeah. And uh, and they it was female only, and they never were big, but their their topics were big. So they actually influenced all the other parties that eventually yeah. had to kind of adopt female topics on the agenda and there we got the the maternity leave stuff better and you know like they they brought a lot of stuff and then actually that party just merged into another party later on and 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 kind of disappeared but it definitely was needed for the time has there never been here like a female all female political party for example no let's start one and i think that nowadays the role role model when it comes to countries in politics is Slovakia mm. because they have a female president yeah. and uh, it's am- it, it, it's amazing that it happened and I think that we should feel a bit embarrassed that we were not able yet to The to farmers so. in Slovakia were ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah. Um, there is, um, like, if I, if I... If I put me in the... In a, let me say, if I put myself in the shoes of a white middle-aged man, <laughs> which I happen to be, then one argument would be to say, well, this system where the, the woman takes care of the home and the kids and the and the man is out working, that actually is maximizing the return and optimizing the economy. I mean, do we actually need to change anything? What do you think, Divana? If you ask me if it's working, it is working. Mm. You can't deny that it's not working. The man works, the woman is dedicated to the family. I grew up in a family like that, Mm. and it worked. Mm. We were happy. We had a mother that was dedicated to us. Um, So in the pure sense of the word, you know, yeah, it is working. But um, I think the mindset of the modern woman has evolved Mm. beyond that, beyond just the... Um, comfortable home picture of perfection, which is, you know, mother with kids at home, beautiful house, you know, cooked meal, husband at work, everybody's happy. Um, I think nowadays uh, uh, women with families want a bit more Mm -hmm. than that. Um, Women with families, they want a bit more than Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's no longer enough just Mm -hmm. to be home, just to have the kids. I can say from my own experience that um, even though I could afford to just be home and not to work, mm. I always felt the need that I wanted to do something else with my time and I didn't want to be concentrated just on uh, kids and homework and uh, um, cooking meals and shopping and um, sometimes even doing nothing during mm. the day. Mm. I wanted to do something more. So, um, yeah, I think nowadays women are a lot more motivated, more determined to do something else. You know. Yeah, but it's not about just, um, if you think about it, there are three groups involved in this case that you mentioned. There is the, the woman, the man, and the child. Mm-hmm. So, actually, the child gets its mom's care. Uh, the husband gets a great home. Mm-hmm. And the woman? Is, and the woman <laughs> the uh, mom? Is, is, is a mom, you know. like Isn't, isn't <laughs> so it just fine like this? It's a mom. She doesn't get anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um well, economically, I don't think it really benefits that mm. much society because if woman, uh, if the woman go ba- goes back to work, she will pay taxes mm. towards the mm. country. So that will benefit already. This is another um, member of a family that pays taxes. Um, yes, demographically, it might not help because it will put off having another child, for example, mm. for a bit later. And um, as we know, currently Europe is struggling with a demographic issue. So... Uh, uh, one thing on the agenda should be having children, but in this scenario, it will be delayed. Mm. 
mm. because the woman will concentrate on a career, on her personal development, personal, you know, also business development, for example. So, um, you know, the two separate scenarios, they they can be beneficial depending on what you really want, mm. you know. Uh, there are women that are perfectly satisfied with being at home, and there is nothing wrong with that because mm. um, on, we also have nowadays the perception that if you're not a working mom and if you're not a working woman, something is wrong with you yeah. and um, you are not enough and that you are just wasting your time and that you're basically a waste of a person. Which I can tell you that for someone that was for five years on a maternity leave, it's actually a very hurtful thing to hear yeah. because you're not wasting your time. You know, I, sp you I spoke <laughs> to, I uh, actually talked to a, a friend of mine. Uh, she has two kids and and when the quarantine or the, the kind of these lockdowns had been going on for a few weeks and she said, well, this is kind of my life for the last four <laughs> years. <laughs> exactly. And I just realized, oh, shit. Not but much of a difference, you no. know. But uh, yeah, if you want to stay home, stay home. Yeah. If you're comfortable like this, perfectly, perfectly fine. But if you want to develop, I would encourage any mom out there that if you feel the need to think you know, and come up with new ideas, go for it. Yeah, and I mean, we, we of course, we, we, we shouldn't exclude that, that you know, a, a, a person or a woman who is now staying at home and, and um, doesn't find her way into the career, that could be the woman who invents the next great invention, you know, like we, we, we there, there is so a contribution right. beyond just taxes and, and, and yeah. that. Um, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There was this great example of the stay-at-home mom that invented the mop. Mm. You remember, she was American. I completely forgot her name. But this actually, she invented something out of a need. From the home. To mop her floors. Yeah. Because there was not a proper mop. So she m invented that mop that you squeeze it and, you know, and like you squeeze the water out of it. So there you go. You know, stay-at-home mom, two kids or three kids. And you come up with something that um, you invent. You yeah. know, five years later, she's a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, it's a really good example, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, if we talk about like careers versus motherhood, um, and um, I, I, I felt it here, um, I've, I've told this before, that I remember the first time that I met a woman who was working for me and she was going on a maternal leave and thought she would be just be back in six months and said, no, 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 I will see you in a few years. And... And I started talking about this, and I felt that there was some sort of a stigma about this in the way that um, um, if you don't do those three years, if you don't do the mandatory or like or the the longest possible period, then then you're somehow a bad mom. Is this is this a thing? As I mentioned, I'm not mom yet, but uh, of course I have certain scenario in my in my head, and. To come back a bit to, to the point um, we just discussed, I think that actually it, everything starts with women. The next one is men and the child is as a third one in a way because if you are a happy mom, mm. you are a happy wife mm. and your husband is happy and the kids is happy. And um, most commonly your kid is leaving the house after 18 years old, maybe even earlier going to university. And then you and your husband, you are then together at home and then you realize oh we have been so much focused to our kid for last 18 years and now I don't know who you are actually what is your favorite meal what wine you are drinking so I think that people need to be careful to not to be so much dedicated to the kid in terms of forgetting that there is a husband and mm. there is myself mm. so if you would love to have I don't know, bi-weekly or weekly, catch up with your friends, going to wine, just just do it. Just mm. say to your husband, hey, I need time for myself. Of course, again, I'm now presenting this not to be in the mom role, yeah. but I think that it is possible because I see people around me. But is it is it if you if you if you if you have this career, like like let's take you as an example. I mean you have a kind of a international global role. If you if you want to keep that role, you're not going to be able to go away for three years. So let's say that you had a six years maternity, or six six months maternity leave, and then you went back to work. Would your friends judge you? Would your family judge you? Would your granny? Okay, it's a bad example because of your family how it was, but would people judge you, or would society judge you? Yeah, they will judge me. Uh huh. And as I'm, a bad mom. Yeah, and I'm ready for it, and that's why. I am talking about it loudly, mm. not only today, but even five years ago when I was not thinking the time to have a kid, I was already talking to 
my parents and that time to my boyfriend nowadays, my husband saying, hey, just we need to be clear. I am not going to maternity leave. Mm. I, I love my job and to make myself happy, you happy and our family life happy, I I need to I, I need to work and he's fine. So he we have even agreed that of course first maybe three months kid need you, but then why men cannot change uh, mm. the clothes and cannot cannot go, you know? So you can always balance it and my husband is ready for it and I'm happy that I have his support mm. because I think that you need to prepare a bit the environment, but I know that I will be judged from some family members and as well from my friends. Mm. But I think that we need to understand that, as Dimana mentioned, I I would never judge my friends or people around me who are at, at home all the time and not going back to work because they enjoy and they are happy at home. Mm. It's their choice. But what I see as a wrong thing is when you are at home taking care of your kids, you are not happy and always complaining. Mm. So here I see, okay, so why you do not change it? So mm. if you will be only talking about it, it will never change. Mm. Um, but how, like the, the change of, of, of all this um, to kind of increase female participation, to kind of close the pay gap and the gender gap, and uh, um, you need some... Yeah, we said political support, for example, we need those pioneers. But we also kind of need the society to to uh, to to be in agreement with this. And what I have felt from my conversations here with, with uh, women is that there is a lot of other women that are actually not very excited about this. That... Um, and I remember there was a guest here on my, my episode recently, Sylvie Lauter, a journalist, and she, she searched this phrase in a, in a uh, media database. I am not a feminist, but... Hmm. So, and I was like, okay. And that, that, it returned thousands of results where women were actually saying, well, I'm not a feminist, but... Or men were saying this. So kind of taking the female matters seems to be a little bit not this not not what people like so much right people don't want to be perceived i think today as feminists because of like i said earlier the picture of feminism that mm. is painted today mm. it's a radical picture of feminism um it's a lot of um in the popular culture you know a lot of women that feel empowered by their um, sexuality, it's a gender empowerment, gender, like the sexuality, the ethnicity empowerment as well. Um, the wanting to put men down to challenge this, like the statu quo from before, and uh, for women to come on top of everything. Um, I didn't think of myself as a feminist before. But um, if you sit and read, and you understand, I think, the subject of feminism exactly, um, if you um, watch a few TV shows that are on that topic that could be very, very influential, you understand that actually deep down you are a feminist mm. and that um, you would agree with the point of view that uh, we do need a little bit more gender equality. We need equal representation uh, culturally, politically, economically as well. But is the society ready for this? I mean, is, the, is, is this what the society is asking for? Or is it just two girls like you screaming in the wind? No, I think oh, society is ready. I think society is ready. We're not the only ones that are talking about it. There mm. are other institutions, there are other um, communities in Prague that are mm. uh, discussing this, that are offering support. But um, in terms of a movement... There is nothing defined as a movement mm. around the world, not in Czech Republic, even around the world, that can be united under an idea uh, about um, a female equality, female power, or something. But who, who was against this? Who, uh, do you have? Do you see any like, let's say, is there someone who writes an article in the paper and just says, "No, women should stay at home"? Is there anyone in 2021 that steps out of his cave or her cave and writes something like that? It could be. Yeah, there are many, <laughs> I would yeah. say, older psychologists and, and doctors yeah. in that area. And they try to comment and argue that for for the kid, it's important to mm. have this emotional connection with, with mom. And uh, yeah, so of course, they there are different opinions. 
but uh, yeah, I do not have a name or someone who is like oh, a radical yeah. publicly always, you know, but commenting on that. But there are some. That. There are some. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, it's there could be. I mean, we live in a free society, so yeah, anyone yeah, is free to express their opinions as long as they're not hurtful, you mm. know, harm, mm. uh, harmful, not hurtful, mm. harmful. You know. mm. So yeah, everything is hurtful now. Whatever you say, <laughs> everything is hurtful. That's why you know a little bit uh, the cancel culture. Yeah, <laughs> so but I think that maybe as well the thing of respect because um, I have an a, a example, not um, like my own, but uh, that uh, my friend she was applying for a job and, and she has a two years old kid, and the first question that person asks is. And how you will manage with your family? Mm. How you will manage with your kid? And and you know she was like, why he was asking me that? I am sure that if my husband or any other man at that age would be there, no one will ever question that man like how you will take care of your family if you will mm. get a job. Mm. So it opened my eyes that as well this kind of like respect is needed. That of course when you are a mom, you have certain uh, certain. Um, Mm, things you need to do, such as drop off your kids in in a school. So I think that we need to be respectful as a as a teams, as a colleague. So if we know that she is dropping off the kids every day in the kindergarten, I would never put a meeting at eight. Mm. But if you are a man and you don't have a family, you really do not realize it, and you are not respectful, and then you put immediately the woman under pressure mm. that she's uh, not a good mom because she doesn't have a time to drop off the kid, you are late for the meeting. So I think that there needs to be a clarity as well saying, yeah, I am a mom. I, I need to start all the meetings as of 10 because before mm. I am taking care of my kids. Dot, and then people need to respect it. Mm. Um, but also her, her, her man or husband could just take the kids to the kindergarten. Yeah, of and course. Then she could be in every meeting at 8. Well, <laughs> you know, I think that the reality of maternity leave and this like distribution of responsibilities is a little bit uh, more layered mm. than that. Mm. Because um, <clears throat> even when the kids are going into kindergarten, most of the kindergartens want you to pick up your child at 3.30. Uh -huh. You know, okay. so uh, if you're working 9 to 5, it's uh, clearly impossible to pick up the child that early. If you pick it up at 5, which is still before the end of the working day, um, you get really bad looks and uh, judgments as like, oh, this child is sitting here waiting for you. Mm. Why are you not here earlier? So, um, you know, the, the the complexity of finding this balance, even with um, a supportive partner, and it's wonderful that you have a partner that is supportive that would take care of the family when you can, but the reality is that not many guys will be um, that uh, dedicated, you know, and the problem comes that when the guy is not dedicated, he just says, oh, I have to make money. I'm the one yeah. that, 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 you know, the breadwinner. Yeah. So uh, don't bother me anymore. And then you as a mother, you don't really have a choice because you do understand that someone needs to put food on the table. Mm. It's clearly not you because you are the mom who is taking care of the child. And the maternity pay here is, is peanuts. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, not, it's not that small peanuts, but it's like, let's say, <laughs> bigger peanuts, you know? Mm. <laughs> it's like somewhere in the middle. Um, it is peanuts, <laughs> <laughs> compared, it is peanuts to compared to a salary in a corporate yeah. world. The, well, yeah. Clearly, yeah, in this comparison, yeah, yeah, it is. But it's a, yeah. Yeah, uh, oh, I, I, and I get what you mean, because obviously with this, if if, if the structure of the society and the, and the kindergarten and the daycare and schools and whatever yeah. means that there one of the parents has to be available at hours that are, you know, not work friendly, then of course it's a problem. But we, the solution to this might be coming now, uh, in terms of COVID, because now with the COVID having been on for ages, yeah. a year or more, um, that what has happened is that this is a, that situation is actually, uh, let's say, the co companies have learned to have employees at home in home office. It's not home office, it's not anymore just a nice day in the pajamas once a week. It's become like an everyday thing. Yeah. And people have to perform and, 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 and the technology has become better and everything has kind of moved towards this direction. Meaning that, you know, working hours might be more flexible. Plus, if you're working from home, it's possible for a mom to start working if both parents are working from home 
that this could open up some opportunities to to women that in the future that that opportunities that hadn't been open because of these practical issues, you know, driving, picking up, and so on. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that this is actually the example of the bad example I was talking before that mm. something bad needs to happen for to good outcomes. Yeah. yeah. So this is actually the, the example when two years ago I was. Telling to my mom, yes, on Friday I am taking home office. How? And what you will do? You you will not work and blah blah blah. So nowadays, of course, if it would be only for one month, you will not see the impact of having all teams one month and home office. Mm. But as it is already for one year, and you know we are here, we can buy water, we can dr- you know go to public transportation. Everything is basically in a way working that mm. it means that okay the home offices are okay so people can work from home and even they are working more because i do feel it the same that i i have more energy because i can sleep a bit longer to do my morning sport and still i am ready with my morning coffee in front of the computer at nine o'clock mm. and i'm super happy empowered because i have done my morning routine and i'm working usually even longer till six seven which mm. is sometimes too long because yeah i am just uh, energized energized and i do not need to go from office back home etc because everything is at one place so mm. i think that this would definitely help to women to balance uh, their uh, work life and uh, f- family life mm. but i think that the crucial point is the school mm. Because my uh, brother's wife, uh, she's at home with the smaller one and uh, the older one, she's in the third grade. And uh, yeah, from September, she was only three weeks in a school. Mm. And she told me, I don't know how people are doing it if they need to work even from home. Yeah, like yeah, because you need to home, home you school. You need to child. basically yeah. sit next to the kids. So I think yeah. that this needs to be fixed. Yeah, yeah. And then... And then yeah. people will have more opportunities yeah. to stay home. And I yeah. think that more companies are going to that direction. You see that all the, all the open spaces yeah. are yeah. are empty. There is dark and it's for rent, free for yeah. rent, because they realize that yeah, people are effective at home. Yeah, exactly. I... Um, yeah, I was thinking like when I look at future females, you are you are very much looking into it on a kind of an individual basis. You are encouraging that individual, let's say, and uh, um, and as entrepreneurs, uh, you know, trainings and uh, access to experts and so on. Um, so, is the way. For, is that kind of how do you say like uh, is that the way for a woman here to to get what she wants career wise is that maybe a better path to go as an entrepreneur or start your own business than to try to kind of i don't know work herself up build in, a career yeah yeah i mean they can bypass the glass roof or ceiling <laughs> okay. i, I want to see them <laughs> really bypassing the the glass ceiling to be honest um I think that being an entrepreneur, if you do it right, mm. can give you financial independence and freedom to manage your time, energy, efforts more um, more up to your own schedule and uh, be your own boss, basically. Mm. I mean, ultimately, that's everybody's dream, you know, uh, to be your own boss, to, to, to be free to do what you want from wherever you want it and to receive good money for it. I mean, <laughs> seems to be... <laughs> Sounds like a dream. <laughs> Sounds like a dream. It's like, you know, it's Don't like be a podcaster then, if, <laughs> if, if the money is part of it. The, it's a perfect formula. But mm. um, to be honest, you have to be honest with yourself mm. when you're starting this journey if you are born to be an entrepreneur because that is not something that everybody has inside. You, it's not a calling, you know. Uh, certain people work better in a corporate environment, for mm. example, mm. because they like the structure. They like that um, they don't have to deal with, uh, you know, in a way, banalities like accounting and lawyers and um, a lot of other small details that come with it or entrepreneurship. Mm. Because it's very fancy to to listen to an entrepreneur on the radio and be like, oh, 
he came up with an app and I can do that. And this is such a great life. You're your own mm. boss and you live the hipster life in a cool office. But the reality is that as a business owner, you never stop working. No, no. And you have to change no. the light bulbs and f- clean the toilet. You do everything. Mm. You have to think of every single little aspect of yeah. being an entrepreneur. So before you start a business, it's very important to think, yeah, um, mm. can I actually do that? Do I have the effort? Do I have the money for it? Do I have the time for it? Mm. Do I have the confidence for it? Mm. Well, um, in a, to, to build a career, well, it's not easy. I'm sure, you know, Barak has been in a corporate environment for 10 years and it's a very different environment, right, from being an entrepreneur. Uh, it takes effort, it takes a lot of politics, I'm sure. It takes a lot of negotiations and mm. uh, it's... Um, yeah, it's, it's, a cho- it's a choice. It's, it's a, a different choice. choice. It's, yeah. a, it's a choice. Mm. But, you know, for women, we would like to uh, encourage them to mm. take the entrepreneurship path mm. um, simply because <laughs> they're almost, like, not many of them. Mm. In the Czech Republic, statistically, not many of them, you know. Um, it's, you know, uh, quite shocking that only about like 3% of investment goes to female-led startups, mm. for okay. example. Which is a very unfortunate statistic. I wish it was at least like 20-25%, you know, but like 3% is like close to nothing, mm. for example. Or um, so, or, or when investments are going towards startups, only about fifteen um, percent of them have females mm. in the founders teams, mm. which is again a disappointing statistic. But so this is what you're there to work on. I mean, you you are trying to change this. You're trying to yeah. open this path yeah. for the. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's coming back to those role models because there are a couple of role models when it comes to women's as well, but they are already in a space, I would say, that uh, of course they are talking about different budgets, about uh, Mm. different success. I know that they have been maybe five, ten years ago at at the beginning, but I think that it's important to find those, let's say, normal models who are close to us, that I can touch them, I can understand them, uh, we can talk that maybe I can now dedicate... 100,000 uh, grounds for the beginning. I do not have more and this is my investment to my business and mm. to discuss this, let's say, tangible examples, not to talking in millions and billions because then, you know, it's nice success story. Thanks for inspiration, but, you know, it even demotivates yeah, me. Re- you can't relate it's not to real, it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that our, our goal is as well to find those I don't want to call them normal women. It sounds um, it sounds so weird, but you know those more relatable. Yeah, more Re- yeah. yeah determined women. Determined women, who, yeah, yeah, who are living their dream and yeah. they are fine. They are happy, but yeah, maybe Forbes hasn't uh, wrote article about them, and it's fine. We mm. do not yeah. need to always you know look at people who are in Forbes and this is the role model for me. Not at all. Mm. Yeah. Um, but you, you're doing this through like the the way. Well, yeah, what what Future Females does is the, you do that through seminars and 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 different kind of things. I mean, I saw the you wrote this article about the gender equality and 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 uh, uh, I saw that you were doing the other day uh, what, like a career thing with that guy from uh, this. Uh, Good call. Yeah, yeah. And, Blake uh, Whitman. We're not allowed to say other recruiting services because one of the sponsors is a job app. No, no I'm joking. <laughs> um, and uh, it's just a much better job app. <laughs> but, uh, Which one is it? Uh, Alfred. Oh, okay. uh, Alfredjobs.cz. And, um, or Alfred.cz. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing stuff. <laughs> um, so so you're doing those kind of things, reaching out to, to people uh, or, or women. Um, and... Uh, you had something called digital self confidence thingy. What 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 was that? What is that about? That was our first event, uh, the launch event. We thought that um, we can start with something motivational mm. to build our digital self confidence. It was take a, a better selfie. Take a better selfie. No. no. <laughs> well, if that if that will make you confident, <laughs> it's part of your journey. You know, it's a few steps. Mm. But uh, no, ultimately, it was connected to COVID. It was connected to moving your whole business online, uh, your entire image online. Okay. 
because it's um, very different uh, when you're sitting face to face with someone, but it's also very different when you're in Zoom calls. You know, mm. nowadays people are um, conducting interviews on Zoom. They not network us, on Zoom. Not us. We Not us. Here, here we have person. two meters difference, but <laughs> I mean uh, distance. <laughs> distance, but um, yeah. So yeah. Mm, Sorry. Yeah. So uh, it's about like that. Our whole lives moved online. Mm -hmm. Everything was online. We talk mm -hmm. online. We network online. We work online. So in a way, people were not really prepared for that. And a lot of uh, women, we felt that wouldn't have the confidence to take that step to be present online, you mm -hmm. know, because it takes a completely different body language, different uh, presentation, um, how you sit, how you talk. Um, so we thought that it would be a nice inspirational event to mm -hmm. start with. We had an amazing speaker. Her name is Christina Montean, and she led the event beautifully. Uh, and I think people were really happy with mm -hmm. what they learned, actually, mm -hmm. uh, because she teaches, you know, um, um, emotional intelligence, which is... Uh, something we underestimate, uh, for example, in our communications with people. Uh, she deals with like branding yourself online, which is something that we underestimate. It's not always about your brand online, but about mm. you mm. as a brand, your mm. face, you mm. know, how you present yourself to the world, how people perceive you, you know, mm. because that could be a key for your success, for example, mm. how you sell yourself and your confidence. Yeah. So um, this was... We felt was very important, and I think that it also worked with me and Bara on as owners of co-founders of uh -huh. future females to gain a, like a little bit more confidence to present it to people, to approach people, to network with people uh -huh. as well. Because it, it, in the end of the day, it's an art, you know. Yeah, it's uh, it's an acquired skill, mm. actually. Um, but. What else? Like what? What more? Like I mean, like what? What's kind of upcoming from from Future Females? What's on the, the horizon now? So um, we are committed to launch uh, event every month. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a plan for the whole year, but of course, uh, COVID heavily impacted maybe some topics which are not nowadays relevant, so they are postponed. So. The next one, which is coming, is about startup environment. So we have four amazing speakers, um, some founders and as well investors. So mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to that one because I think the vibe will be amazing and inspirational. Uh, a part of the events, of course, uh, we would love to maybe deep dive in certain topics to create um, seminars for smaller groups to dedicate a topic, for example, um, how to build your uh, strong LinkedIn profile or LinkedIn presentation, mm. for example. So it will be really specific, so not it's very too generic. Practical, yeah. yeah. Of course, we are counting, unfortunately, that still uh, this year it will be heavily online. So as well, those topics need to be picked in a way that you can participate and you can do it as a, as a seminar and, and workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think that we would love to as well... Uh, spread uh, spread a message throughout other medias uh, maybe be invited in another podcast and mm -hmm. as well to publish more art articles because yeah i think that nowadays people are more keen to listen to read because uh, they have more time and yeah they need some inspiration and light at the end of the tunnel so mm -hmm. i think that it will be great to have as well more opportunities when it comes to uh, public uh, uh, public presentation and if I want to participate in something like this as a, as a, or if I want to, I don't know, is this a membership or, or, or how do I, what, how does this work for, for? No, all events are free. Uh -huh. um, at the moment, everything is uh, free because firstly it's online. And uh, secondly, we're more focused on building a community at the moment uh, and spreading awareness about what we do. So if you want to participate, for example, our events are listed on um, different registration platforms, uh, on uh, one registration platform, I'm sorry, mm. uh, called Eventbrite. It can be found on our uh, LinkedIn events page, uh, also on Facebook. Mm -hmm. You can find it on Instagram. So to be honest, every social media that you can think of, you can find us there. And, um, you know, you can always get in touch with us. And mm. if anyone has any questions, we'll happily answer and direct them to the place where they can register for it. And how, like an organization like this that is uh, helping and empowering, um, is there a point where you think we, we've we done what we need to do, we can quit? 
will you ever reach perfection in this or a, or a, an acceptable situation? As you mentioned at the beginning, there is a headquarter and uh, there is a group of founders who are giving the global direction. Mm. But of course, each country has a different need, different uh, situation. So we sit down together with Vimana and said, okay, this is the um, this is the goal and purpose of the global organization. But what we would love to really get after within 2021 as a Barbora, Dimana, and Future Female Sprague chapter. So let's put it on paper. So we created uh, a plan for us. Of course, we would love to uh, take as much as we can till 31st of December. Mm. And uh, on, on the other side, we are flexible. But uh, I think that our goal is to... Uh, get known to 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 in a in an environment of uh, women, uh, especially here in Prague. Uh, I would love them to know who is future females, mm. and that they will say, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, I participated even, yeah, yeah I, I read the yeah, cool yeah, I stuff. heard about it in the podcast. Yeah, yeah I heard <laughs> about it in the podcast. Exactly. Yeah. And what I would see as a competitive advantage as well is that we agreed to. Do it in English because, of course, as a local chapter, we are allowed to do it in uh, in Czech. But uh, we realized, and as well, I use my personal experience that when I was in Netherlands, it was great that I could join many of those kind of communities and events because they were in English. Mm. For them, it was more or less automatic, especially in Amsterdam. Then when I moved to Germany, it was other way around. So everything no one, everything was in German, even if it was international, if foreigners were invited, everything was in German. Mm. And as Prague is now the city where like many people from surrounding countries are, are coming to, to study, to, to work, etc. I felt that it's great to to give them the opportunity to um, to join as well. Mm. On the other side, for Czech people, it's great that they can have, let's say, double combo because they can get amazing stuff and as well to uh, use their English. Yeah, mm. to to have it in English. So mm. yeah. But but I mean, what I mean also is that is is work like this ever over? You know, will you will you ever be able to say, I don't know, the year is twenty thirty four and. And y- and you are sitting and having coffee in the old bar, and I'm pensioned somewhere in the <laughs> sun. Mm. And then you say, "Listen, Dimana, we can cl- close down future females. We we've we've solved everything." D- or or you know, do you think that that there is some sort of an end goal? I think that with each generation now, Gen Gen Z is going to the working market. They are at the age twenty five. The the older ones and they are, uh, they start to work so they will definitely open another things which we millennials some need, new some things. some new things so uh, i think that this would n- never change and no. i think it it's good and i think that working across generations learn from each others it's great so mm. i hope that maybe let's say next year we will be sitting here at the same time but you would need more microphones because maybe there will be 10 beautiful women mm. l- leading Prague chapter talking about the amazing stuff we have done. So I hope that, yeah, it's yeah, not just uh, a dream. <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting. I think I would have to buy a bigger bunker. <laughs> um, just um, now, I, I, I don't know you very much. I, I, I we, we just met very briefly and then yeah. we communicated a little bit. And, and um, um, what I found very interesting is how different you are from each other um, in many ways. Um, but you find each other on this topic somehow. But how is the cooperation between the two of you? Is one of you like the the bulldozer and the other one is more the inspector? Or, or how, how is the dynamic between you, just out of curiosity? Uh, the dynamic actually is really good. Mm. You know, um, you don't always meet a partner uh, that you are connected with through an organization because both of us applied to future females to be ambassadors um, you have an onboarding process and you prepare a research proposal in advance. So it's not just like, oh, I want this, I pump, mm, I get it. Mm. There's actual like a process into uh, being getting on board with the whole organization. And in a way, you know, I applied, she applied and we got matched together. And from day one, in a way, we were synced with Para of uh, about what we want, how we want to approach it. 
character wise we're different because I I'm a bit more you know emotional I get to panic a bit more and uh, <laughs> you know from that perspective but it is very organized she's calm she's always like calm down everything's fine don't worry mm. we have enough time and I'm like no we don't <laughs> uh-huh, but so it works out <laughs> in the end it works it, you know it works out in the end I think that we are actually quite balanced maybe exactly because we're different mm. you know and um you know, culturally, we're different. She's Czech, but she's been working around. She comes from a different, like, family background. Me as well. So I think that we meet very nicely in the middle. Mm. And um, even though the reality is that actually we don't know each other very well <laughs> uh, for the moment, because we know each other for, like, what, like, six months almost? Like, something yeah. like that? Like, five, mm. six months, which is not a lot to get to know a person. But uh, we're lucky that the partnership worked from mm. the beginning because... You know, it could have been a disaster. Yeah. But it's uh, it's quite working quite well. Yeah, it was interesting because just, uh, yeah, like I told you before we started recording, then um, you're, I could just see it in the way that you communicated with me how, how different you are. And that I was just curious about this because it is it, this organization here or this chapter is yeah. about you too. I mean, it's, it's all depending on what you do and how. Um, anyway, so... Uh, if people want to know more, so what's the web page? So the official uh, web page is futurefemales.co, mm-hmm. so pay attention, not com, not net, co. Mm-hmm. And this is the global global web page, so you can have a look as well on other products Future Females are offering, such as uh, Business School and Founders Club, and then you will find their chapters, and under Prague you will find... Um, myself and Demana, and you can as well sign up for newsletters. Mm. However, this is more generic chapter. You will see there the um, upcoming event, but we are much more active on, on social media. Mm-hmm. But of course, we are building it up. So we have uh, Instagram account, uh, Future Females Prague. The same for uh, Facebook and as well LinkedIn. So mm-hmm. we are active on all three platforms. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we communicate not only our events and activations, but especially on LinkedIn, we, we share if we uh, find interesting article or information to, uh, to be published. So we are quite active there, more from business side. On Instagram, it's more about inspiration. So motivational quotes and as well supporting other chapters which is great that on instagram is very active that each chapter is running their own account and we support each other Mm -hmm. that's great i'm already a follower Mm -hmm. on all all mediums (laughs) Um, and uh, so you said there's like at least one event per month um, and uh, and that you can find on the social media pages, I guess you can, or, yeah. or an, on the chapter page, and plus then you on ev- event bright, event bright, yeah. event bright, yeah. And and that's now everything is online, right? Everything is online yeah. Yeah, for the moment, yeah. We'd and we everything is in English. Everything is in English. We wish that it was we had physical events so that we can meet people mm. eye to eye, mm. because you know our um, style of communicating with uh, even our. A community is personal. It's interactive. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, um, eye to eye, mm. you know, level, mm. the same level. And we encourage people to get in touch. You know, if they have ideas, they can share. If um, they want to connect us with someone that they think it's inspirational, mm. uh, we are more than welcome for suggestions. So, um, you know, very yeah. personal approach. Yeah, I mean, this is how I found you. I saw this article and I thought it was interesting to figure exactly. out more and. and uh, I've always been curious about f- female and feminist matters and gender equality here yeah. in this country. I've been living here for ten years, and I, I, yeah, I, I think we can do better. Maybe who knows when this COVID thing is over and we look back in history, we will say that this was the catalyst. The COVID was the catalyst that actually made women participate more in the workplace. That we offered flexible hours, and and you know, yeah. um, who who knows that that could be a big change. And then with organizations like yours supporting it, then that that could be good. I think we are kind of done. Is there anything that I'm not saying that is super important or you were want to say that is super important? No, I mean, we can always continue talking, yeah. but time is running yeah. out. So I well, guess time we'll leave never, it for next time. Time never <laughs> runs out. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so you guys that are listening, and that includes you, mom, then you can follow the show on Facebook. There is a Facebook page called uh, The Bunker, How the Hell Did We End Up Here? 
there's an Instagram account called uh, Bunker Prague, and my Twitter and Instagram is Midlife Crisis Warrior. Um, yeah, thanks to the sponsors Alfred Jobs and the Old Bar. Uh, yeah, and if you're listening to this on an iPhone, um, then go and rate the show and review it in the App Store or this Apple podcast thingy that is there. Because that that apparently m- means a big thing for me and would give me exposure. And uh, follow the show. And yeah, I think that's kind of everything. Yeah, if you know anyone cool that is living in Prague, has an interesting story, interesting background, or has done something cool, or is working on a project that is cool, feel free to put them forward. And those of you who hate me because of my episode about the polyamory, uh, the, the religious guys stop sending me emails. I will not change anything about this episode. Uh, thanks, girls, for coming. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. you. Yeah. Have, Thank a ni- you. have a nice evening. Yeah. You too. Thank you. And Thank you. Enjoy the evening. And please, ladies, girls, uh, moms, grandmoms, mothers, join us because, yeah, it will be big. We promise. <laughs> cool. <Okay. laughs>